We are home. We're home. Hey girls, we're home. Your phone's ringing. Somebody thinks you're home. Hey little ones. Is that hot enough for you? Huh? It is. Is it hot enough for you? I got another present today. Her birthday goes on and on and on. <laughs> it's from Living on a Dime from Thank You So Much. I have not opened it. I, da, 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 I, I da. cut it in the house so I can. Oh, it's a shirt. What does this say? Oh my goodness. Have you hugged your chicken have today? Have you hugged your chicken I love today it. from Backyard Poultry? Oh, and it's pink. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. And a card. And a card. I have friends. That's so surprising. <laughs> oh, yeast foam recipe. Thinking of you. Thank you. We just got home from the third day of the elderberry workshop. The elderberry workshop. I love this. And we are going to, we're all inspired now. We're going to well, go out and. Our minds have been open to possibilities. Uh, amazing, amazing opportunity for those of you who enjoy elderberries, uh, find that its uses are fantastic, you love the flavors, uh, you love the medicinal values of it, um, you know what we're talking about. It's, it's, it's a great, it's a great food. So we were with a ton of people, well over a hundred. Well, several, several wannabe growers, several current growers, people have been growing for a while, and uh, three, at least three, three different buyers, buyers yeah. who, who uh, they do a lot of distribution, wide range of products. Uh, some of the products you probably buy, actually. So it was actually really, two of them you probably buy. It was really cool. One that you don't. It's out of Canada, and they don't sell them in the they U.S. Don't they sell in Canada and internationally, but they don't sell them in the U.S. because. People in the U.S. don't want to buy things made in Canada, even though it's he, the same as he, he made that in the U.S. He used that excuse. Yeah. He doesn't think that the uh, United States market is as good as the markets he has. Well, from what he's, what <laughs> he's describing, it's not. <laughs> we in the United States, as a group, really don't know elderberries. But his market, he has a huge market all the way across Canada and Asia. Yeah, his, his, his Asian huge. market is huge. Well, let's go work. Yeah, we I don't know that I'm taking the camera out there because no, we're gonna no, we're, we're gonna measure our field and see what we're doing. We want to plan out where our elderberries are going. Yeah, this is so cool. All right, we need some help identifying some of these chickens. What are the breeds? We we know we're pretty sure that these are the. Okay, so we think that this might be a lavender Orpington, those right there. And then we have this one, which is called the Transylvania Bear Neck. But we don't know what these ones that look like crows are. Or some of these black and white ones are white and black ones. We just don't know what these chickens are. So if you know of any of these chickens, will you let us know? They're definitely not a breed we're used to and I'm freaking them out, so I'm gonna pull back. So, <laughs> they don't usually like jump all over each other. Well, we were only home for a little while today. Got home from um, Jefferson City and just for a while and then we got a phone call from a neighbor asking if we wanted to go to the horse show. So it was just a country, little country horse 
you know, barrel racy, around the poles, little, little tiny kids. kids. It was fun. It was really cute. Fun and it was such a cool evening. There was oh, no really humidity. Cool. Okay. It didn't even feel like humidity at all. Anyway, a really quick summary of some of the things that we learned about elderberries. First of all, we're definitely going to grow them. Yes. Uh, we learned about the spot, spotted wing SWD. Uh, starts with a D word that I can't remember. It's a, uh, it's a fly. It. It's a fruit fly. That affects elderberries. Yeah, or blackberries and blueberries. And it's, it's cool. And, and, and it's only been a couple of years that, that it's been recognized as being around. So it's like it's from Asia, I believe. And so it's, it's new and it is a pest that uh, can be pretty devastating. So they showed us things to do if you're not organic and things to do if we are organic. We are going to become organic and um, because there's a really good market for organic uh, elderberries. They, can, they tend to be better quality berries and so forth so, so. that's what we're going to do. Um, we walked off where we went to put the first acre and it's, it was good. And we talked to a conservation manager. From the st uh, from federal, actually. Yeah, and, and she told us that what we're doing with our grass is good. I thought, you know, we didn't have any way to mow it. We didn't have any animals to eat it. And they said, because we're in a drought conditions right now, what we're doing with it is the very, very best. And yeah. so we went it, out it and looked totally at it. It would totally stress it if we were to cut yeah. it all down right we now. We went and looked at it and it's just lush green underneath of the big tall brown ones that are sticking up. So we feel really good about our our land. And I, th I think we're way, the way we're managing it right now means it's the roots are going to force themselves deeper to go after the moisture that's deeper, which means they're going to have a better base. So that when it does start to have moisture again and we mow it, it's going to be in a lot better condition. Right. So. And then we talked on yesterday's video about not wanting to have a monocrop and these people grow monocrops. You know, most of them, there were a couple I think are doing some mixing yeah. things and so up, but we, mostly it's, it's a monocrop. When approach. we were out there today, we were looking and realized that we want, we're going to do the guilds of fruit, the trios of triads, it's what we've always wanted to do. And um, we're going to do those along perpendicular to the way that the rows run and then intersperse other uh, rows of things in between a couple of rows of elderberries. So what I'm saying is you have your elderberries and then you have a 12 foot row of a lane and then elderberries and then a 12 foot lane. And then we're gonna probably put a full lane of rhubarb because we're trying to grow an antioxidant um, filled and uh, orchard. Ru ru orchard. Rhubarbs are really, really good in antioxidants also. And there are other berries as well that really are that good. way. So we're, we're looking at those, doing a planning on doing a combination because we think it'd be the right thing to do. And then the grass that's in between, we're going to put in some lemon balm and even some mint, even though mint is invasive, mint is really good for cutting down some of the insects that are there. And then there's uh, garlic is really good for that. And there's several that are companions that you can plant that we're just going to take the liberty to do. And then we're going to put our chicken tractors so that they go down the lane and um, eat bugs and things like that. So. And, and the timing of the chicken tractors is going to be after we've harvested and we'll do that for the rest of the summer and into the fall, probably won't put them back on there until after the next harvest. Right. So come springtime, because there's pretty strict rules yeah, about that. There, there has to for being organic. There has to be at least 120 days before you harvest that you haven't had animals on the. Actually, that's not for being organic. That's for being able to sell your food as food. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, okay, that's even more. Important. Yeah. So. But we're also going to be growing the crops in the rows, so those are going to need time to grow we, and come up. Yeah, we want to put some alfalfa in there. So, Did you know that alfalfa has 20 to 30 feet roots? Who knew that? 
Anyway, it's really, really good for clay soil. And for those of you who aren't familiar with why that's such a good deal, is the deep roots means the plant is going down deeper and pulling up nutrients that are from down there which go into the leaves. So when you chop those down and they, they lay on the top of the ground and decompose, then they've brought all of this nutrition from way down deep and they've put it up now into the topsoil so it becomes available for the other things that are growing in the topsoil. And the elderberries that we're going to be doing are called the Bob Gordons. We'll do a couple of varieties, but we're, that we're, one... We're going to trial a few varieties from everything that we heard over this, this during this workshop is the Bob Gordons overall perform well and they, the care are, and they are better. And turn their heads down so the birds don't get them as much. Yeah, and, and, and instead of the, the, the berries sticking up, they invert them so they're, they're harder for the birds to get to. And then great idea. we're going to be planting the uh, elderberry canes every 18 inches and then after the second year after they've harvested you cut them down completely you just cut them down completely and, and every year and every year they grow back and they'll grow back out wider and wider and wider and tell well, you they're filling up here. The, the roots lane. send out new shoots right. every year and so by cutting them down it kind of forces that to happen and they send out additional uh, canes every year and those canes they produce first year that they're there it's because the roots are, are giving it the, and, the nutritional needs. And I guess the other thing that I wanted to educate you on is that as they grow, then the lanes that we are having the alfalfa and things in, the roots from the elderberry plants will be going out further, so they're underneath where the lane is. So by putting good um, mulch and fertilizer and everything in the lanes, you're also getting the roots of the elderberries. So that's just a quick summary of some of the things that we learned. Now, I, I believe we mentioned about arsenic. Not arsenic. Cyanide. Cyanide. We did. That we told about the uh, um, study yesterday. Right. Right. And um, you know, maybe a little more de uh, detail and a little more clarification on that because it's important. There, there is a lot of literature out talking about the presence of cyanide. I guess if you Google elderberry, you're going to find out how terrible they are for you, and they've done the the, study. the danger of, of toxic levels of cyanide. And there's been a lot of concern about that and a lot of misinformation. Uh, what, what some of the literature talks about is that the seeds and the stems tend to ha uh, have a higher amount, plus the, the not yet ripe elderberries have a higher amount, which is true. They do show a higher amount than the ripe berries, but, but, they're so but even even. Tiny. It, at their highest levels, they are a small fraction of what you find in apple seeds, for instance, and in apple juice. So when they did the tests, apple juice was like way up here that is on the shelf with cyanide in it. And um, the elderberries were just 0 0.0 whatever, you know, just tiny. So, so way below acceptable levels. So this, the so. University of Missouri has been doing a study on it for years. The, the study will be published soon, but it's, it's a good news story for anybody involved in the, the industry for elderberries or anyone who enjoys using elderberry products is that you don't have to worry about it. It's, it's, right. it's, it's a myth that's based on some, some bad information and you know, we've never been told anything bad about food that isn't true. <laughs> anyway, it was a doctoral student that did it, a doctoral student from Kenya, and he presented to us. So it was really, I mean, it was very scientific. It was a very thorough study. And it was a pretty amazing. So yeah. you can share that with your friends out there. We are going to close this day down. Finally. <laughs> and we'll open it back up tomorrow. So we appreciate all the comments we got from the people, from different people from the newsletters. Thank you for your great responses to us. It means a great deal to us. Maybe one last thing on, on the challenge, the 30 day challenge. What kinds of questions and responses have you been getting that we should touch on? 
you know, um, I've been answering them right along and I don't have them on the top of my okay. head right now. Sure. But I know that for a couple of days, and we warned you that we were going to be gone, so we couldn't do a lot of things. But I did put the thing on with hypoglycemia. Had a lot of people really appreciate that. Um, well, it's a... It's a I know I do people. know one question I got a question about why would you keep the flour in the refrigerator so let me just tell you really quickly when we talk about our bodies being damaged our bodies are damaged by the food that we put into them that is not right so if you take butter and you leave it out and it turns rancid then it's damaged and if you put that in your body then you're putting damaged food now, in your body. Now rancid is like it's oxidized. It is so, oxidizing. So it's taken so, on the radicals. Yeah and yeah. so you're going to put it into your body and then you will have free radicals running around your body. and, and Which I'm, are related to inflammation, is that yes. correct? Yes. Okay. And so you really need to make sure that you're not putting damaged food in your body. So I can open up a package of walnuts, let's say, that have been sitting on the shelf too long and I have to return them because as soon as I open them, I can smell that they're rancid. I can open up flour and smell that it's rancid. I can open up pasta and smell if it's rancid. And so those are things that you... You can't have her nose. We're keeping it. <laughs> but, but it is an odor you can learn to recognize. Oh, yeah. And so you don't want to ingest that. You don't want to say, oh, it's rancid, but it's the only flour I've got. I'm going to use it. You don't want to do that. That's putting damage. A lot of the parts. aches and pains that you feel, the discomfort you feel in various parts of your body is a result of these oxidized foods causing the inflammation in your body. We had a gentleman who came up to us, and by the way, we had just an amazing opportunity to network. To one couple and one single lady were there, not single, she's not single, but she was there by, by, herself. by herself. And they came up to us, um, recognizing us from our YouTube channel. <laughs> like, wow, that's weird. And really cool, actually. But we were able to network so well, and people are really interested in eating right. And in homesteading and growing your own food, they just don't know it. And then when you talk about it, then they just kind of flood around you. It was so cool. And we had this one gentleman who came up and I don't even remember his name. He was sitting behind me the very first day. And uh, I know he's going to be watching because he was going to go home and try to get onto the channel. And he wanted us to go on and tell him which... Um, foods he could eat to help get rid of inflammation. And we used to have a really beautiful diagram on our website. And when we read and it, his our questions website... questions reminded us, oh, we yeah. haven't put that there. So we will be putting that on on Monday or Tuesday and making sure that that gets on. And so we'll be addressing some of the inflammation because it is such an important part of our health. Anyway, I'm going to close this down. Thank you so much. And... Hope you have a great night's sleep or a great day when you're watching this. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for watching.